Okay, good afternoon, everyone. We are on the record. Today is Monday, the 10th day of January, 2022. This is a city council caucus meeting of the Jersey City Municipal Council. We had a scheduled 4 p.m. start. The clock on my computer or my cell phone is showing 4.07 p.m. May we kindly have a roll call for the commencement of this meeting. Councilperson Ridley. She just stepped away. She'll be here. I know she's here, okay. Yeah. Councilperson Prinzeri. Here. Councilperson Baggiano. Here. Councilperson Soleil. Here. Councilperson Solomon. Here. Councilperson Gilmore. Here. Councilperson DeGis. Here. Councilperson per Rivera. Here. Council President Waterman. Here. We have eight council members in attendance at 4.07 p.m. On behalf of City Council President Waterman, in accordance with the New Jersey Public Laws of 1975, Chapter 231, the Open Public Meetings Act, also known as the Sunshine Law, adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by the posting on the bulletin board of the first floor of City Hall, the annual notice, which is the schedule of meetings and caucuses of the Municipal Council for the calendar year 2022, and filed in the office of the City Clerk on Thursday, October 28, 2021. In addition, at its time of its preparation, the agenda of this meeting was similarly disseminated on Friday, January 7, 2022, at 4.45 p.m. to the Municipal Council, Mayor, Business Administrator, Corporation Council, and the local newspapers, and posted on the City's website, so I can certify as to our total compliance with the Sunshine Law. As I stated earlier, we are meeting here in the Council Chambers so we can socially distance a lot better. The ventilation in the room is a lot better. We can leave multiple doors open. So down in the basement, we're a little more confined. So I, we, Council President and I thought it was the best idea is to have the caucus meeting held in the chambers today. Uh, and I do see Councilperson Ridley present at 4.09 p.m. So now we have all nine council members at 4.09 p.m. Before we move on, I would just like to take this opportunity to congratulate each and every one of the council members with, and present them with a certificate of certification of their election, starting in alphabetical order, uh, ABC order, actually the ward order, Councilperson Ridley. By ward. That's a little memento for you, for you guys. All right, with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Council President Waterman. Well, um, good afternoon and Happy New Year to everyone out there. I know it's, uh, we, we have been in this chamber in almost two years, so um, this is something that we're just trying, you know, for um, social distance sake, and so we'll see what happened, okay? If not, you can always go back to uh, virtual. So at this time, I'm gonna call William from Public Safety to present. Normally what we do in the caucus, come on William, normally what we do in caucus is that they sign in, each director signs in, and it's normally first come first serve because sometimes some of the directors have to leave earlier, so if they get here early enough time, then they can um, present and then they can leave, all right? So Jujo, she's out, 
in the lobby. I don't know if I have a director in here who didn't sign the sheet. If you didn't, please see her outside, and then we, um, she'll hand it to me, and we'll go on as usual. Okay, then, so go ahead. We am present to the council. And council, after you present, you can ask any questions you like. Good evening, everyone, and good afternoon. Happy New Year. I'm uh, Bill O'Donnell, representing the Division of Fire, uh, speaking on one resolution that we have. What's that? I'm sorry about that. I thought it was me, Sean. Sorry. No. I I'm, I'm sorry. I'm a little rusty. We haven't been in here almost two years, so bear with us. Go ahead, Bill. Okay. okay, just one resolution that we have for Division of Fire awarding a contract to the Institute of Forensic Psychology, and that is for pre-employment psychological testing. William, could you um, just announce your resolution number 10.12? Sure. This way all the council can follow. Anyone who comes, please. Sure, I'm sorry. 10.12 uh, resolution is 22-017, uh, and that's awarding a contract to the Institute of Forensic Psychology, and this is for the pre-employment psychological testing of fire recruits uh, for a class scheduled to start early spring. Purpose, go ahead. That, uh, that's pretty much it, Council President. Any questions, Council? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That was quick. Bye, Billy. Rodney from HEDC. What's his name? Thank you, Council President. I'm here to present on three resolutions. Uh, the first resolution is 22-012. This is a subordination request uh, to allow the developer to seek construction funds in order to complete his project uh, on Stegman and Dwight Street. Any questions? Second resolution is 22-013. We're asking council authorization to enter into agreement with the developer uh, back, uh, I think, Resolution 21442, which was approved on June 16, 2021, was a recommending resolution. The second part of it is to enter into agreement. This is the second part here. What we're asking now is order to enter into an agreement with the developer. Any questions, Council? Yes, uh, Council President, I had a question on this one. Just so I understood this, this, this was adding six affordable housing units um, to the project through the home funding, is that right? Uh, there will be six home funded units. But again, this was, uh, yes, that is part. That is what it's for. It's six home units, but there are a total of 50 units. Uh, which will be under the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, right. all the 50 units will be affordable. Uh, six will be under the home funds. So that was just trying to clarify, is, it, is the six in addition to the 50? No, no. It's part of the 50. Part of it. Got it. Okay. And, and there was some language in it which I just didn't understand around, um, let me see if I can find it, the, um, um, Something around the, like a return of funds from the home program? Uh, yes, there's $350,000 which were part of a repayment uh, of home funds, we're now gonna, which is part of Choto set aside funds, which we're now including as part of the funding for this particular project. Got it, sorry. That in, our, in, our, in the agreement that we originally, the recommending resolution, yeah we had not identified the total sources under the home fund, under the home program. And so with this, we're using uh, Choto set-aside funds. And sorry, and what are set-aside funds? If you could just help explain that. What is it? What are set-aside funds? Set-aside funds are, uh, Jersey City is an entitlement, entitlement community from HUD, and each year we're allotted uh, in, in the home program around $2.1 million. Part of that allotment is that a portion of it, 15% of our funds, are set aside for CHOTOs, which is a specific 
uh, community housing development organization yeah. with a specific purpose of providing affordable housing. And then we have 10% for admin and then the balance for affordable housing production. And so it's just part of that allocation from HUD as part of our entitlement program. Got it, okay. Thank you, those are my questions. Any other questions? questions? Uh, and my final resolution is resolution 22, Dash 014. This is a we're requesting a discharge of mortgage for the developer. Uh, as part of our operations, we cover our investment with the developer, and because it's a home ownership project, our funding will be secured by individual mortgages with the homeowners. So we're basically relieving the developer of his. Uh, responsibility on the, on the uh, program. Other questions? Go ahead. Does this, um, uh, does this involve an, any form of an agreement with our Division of Affordable Housing? No. Okay, great. Anyone else? Other questions? Thank you, Rodney. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Rodney. Director Stacy Flanagan. Good afternoon. Um, I have resolution 10.4, which is the final allocation from Hudson County Office on Aging, uh, which is the final allocation for last year's senior services. This includes all Meals on Wheels, congregate meals, physical activities, and social engagements for seniors. At the end of the year, they reallocate funding, and then we see how much um, they gave us an addition to see how much we need to take from the funding that we've set aside in the grant at the beginning of the year. So we got a little bit more money so we can take a little bit less from the uh, appropriations. Any questions, council? Okay. Next one, Stacy. go ahead. All right, 10.5 is a resolution to purchase MREs. These are meals ready to eat uh, through Golden Gourmet. We do this every uh, season to ensure that we're prepared for uh, anything such as COVID um, and or a hurricane where seniors cannot leave their home. We purchase these meals in hopes to be reimbursed um, by FEMA if there's a FEMA activity or event or through our Office on Aging contract. And we typically roll these out with five to seven meals per senior who is already on the Meals on Wheels program. And then we provide additional meals inside all of the congregate meal locations. Questions? Stacy, question. Yes. So these, uh, the MREs, uh, these are- They're not traditional MREs. <laughs> They're not something you remember from when you were in the Marines. Uh, these are a little bit more um, palatable. Okay. <laughs> That was my question. I was getting a little worried. Yeah, so it's, um, it's a, uh, a ready-made uh, juice product in a can. Um, it's like a freeze-dried, but not, there's nothing that you add water to or anything like that. <laughs> um, we were, and we can get you a sample of what they are. Um, so they're, they're typically uh, meats or cheeses. There is no... Um, vegan option in this, but that's something that we're working with the USDA on now. Okay. Any more questions? And, oh. can, we, can we get a, uh, a sample? And also, is it common practice that, the, uh, that FEMA does reimburse or? Um, for this particular, yes, typically, um, and if uh, Director Kears is gonna speak next, typically they're purchased by the Office on Emergency Management in preparation for storm. Um, and this past year through, through COVID, we kind of reduced his inventory. So where we fill back the inventory. Uh, so he purchases out of FEMA. This is something absolutely we can charge to FEMA. And while we don't have any in stock right now because they've expired at the end of last year, um, we can absolutely get you um, a sample. More questions? Okay. 
They're located in uh, Georgia. Yeah, there's very few ready-to-eat meals that can be shelf-stable available locally. But if there is any agency that you find, that you know, that has a, like a shelf-stable, ready-to-eat meal, we will absolutely bring them on as a city vendor. Okay, 10.42. This is a new contract with Bespoke Health. Um, this is to execute vaccines. As you may be reading, um, the CDC anticipates boosters available to 12 to 15 year olds. We're working through uh, when to roll that out any day now. And then in the fall, uh, we expect a fourth booster. Uh, our goal is to um, reduce the need for external support and try to bring this in-house by the end of COVID, um, which we anticipate aligns with whatever FEMA costs are available. Last year we spent, I believe, 23 million on, on executing vaccines in multiple locations. Right now we have four locations plus a mobile site. Um, we're executing J&J, &J, Pfizer, and Moderna at, at three of those four sites. Uh, the Bethune Center stayed our, our healthy Moderna space and J&J, &J, so we just kept it as Moderna to not have many people come there, but go to the other Pfizer sites, Connors, Gallo, Pershing Field. Uh, and we are leveraging this particular contract for not just vaccines, but the added testing that you saw that we kicked off on Thursday to do 10 days of, of, of a testing blitz, um, able to be expanded at your interest of rapid test. Um, before coming to this call, I, I spoke with the US HHS Region 2, that's the region that we sit under, New York, New Jersey, and Puerto Rico, who has let me know that there's some free rapid testing that should be executed through the federally qualified healthcare system, but it's not currently, and none of our local federally qualified health centers have requested the free uh, test kits. So I'm gonna follow up with them to hopefully add three more testing locations by the end of, of the week. Um, but this is because um, I think you've all probably received some feedback, I myself waiting nine days for a PCR response. Uh, this all came about around the same time the CDC changed their guidelines telling people they didn't need a test to go back to work and reducing the quarantine and isolation periods. And um, we have Dr. Bastola and two health investigators along with the municipal prosecutor doing some internal investigations on these labs uh, as part, far as follow-up because we don't want anyone who has not received their test results in a timely manner to have had this charge to their insurance because we believe that's just Criminal. Director, uh, I have a question. With yeah. respect to the, uh, to the vaccines, uh, the different kinds of batches, yes. are we getting even batches with respect to Moderna, Pfizer, and uh, Johnson Johnson, or is it a different, you know, different number of batches? Yeah, so right now they've reduced the number of J&J &J they've provided us because we had a surplus during the summer. Uh, and that during the summer, we had a share with other cities who did not get a J&J &J allotment. Uh, right now, we're getting batches based on our anticipation and what we've served the week prior. So every Monday morning, we get a shipment of vaccines based on everything we have served up until Thursday around 4 p.m so that they could say, okay, it looks like you can handle this much, we're gonna get you this much of Moderna, Pfizer, and J&J. &J. Okay. More questions? I'll hear from you. Director, on this contract specifically, can you provide us with a breakdown in costs of what we've spent on Bespoke to date? Yeah, um, so I think it was 23 million we spent last year total, yep. and that was because we, anticip we didn't anticipate child um, vaccines that early. We, we had anticipated about $20 million. We wound up spending about $23 million. Um, I think the final invoice for December came in at, the, at your last meeting. 
Um, I don't have like the, the last few of that, but it's like 23, one point something. Councilman, I'll have finance uh, produce a report for the year end. Great, that'd be great, thank you. And, and you'll see some months it ebb and flows based on like the additional mobile locations that we, so in December, uh, the end of November, most of December, we added multiple pods in the schools. And then when the schools closed for the, the year end, they didn't really wanna kind of have us in every single school because that would be a, a cost to them. But we are working with them in certain locations to see if we can reopen um, and we're working with any new partners to get their vaccine information up to date. A lot of pharmacies are coming online with their vaccine availability, and we push all of that onto the vaccine website, which still is in about six different languages. And then the other request I had, which is connected to this contract, but more broad, is can we get an update on the broad status of sort of vaccination in the city? So yeah, you know, um, the numbers of- if you, Yeah, so if you have not checked out, and I'll send you a link to both um, when I leave this meeting, there is a tableau for vaccines that we execute. Um, we're executing about 83% of fully vaccinated across our city, um, 18 and older. Um, we struggle a little bit under 18, but that's like parental consent and, addition, um, we have it broken down by what we have done in general, so people who live and work, and then inside the, the city, and that's on the JC Tableau page, but I'll send an email to everyone with the link to the vaccine Tableau, along with the link to the caseload um, Tableau, which also indicates uh, the hospitalization rates, um, and then the regional area data information that's updated daily by the Office on Innovation. And the, do you also provide us with an update on um, city employees' uh, percentage vaccine status? I know uh, that, that would be an HR issue, not Health and Human Services. Okay. So because many of them would get vaccinated outside of our, and I don't sure. have access to the names of everyone that's vaccinated, but if that's an interest, then HR would have to handle that. Or I mean, I can put that request to the BA. I just know other cities have released their data of, you know, percentage of employees in this department, this department, that department. I can tell department. you mine. <laughs> right. by, by vaccine status. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, work with HR to, to okay, see great. the Thank you. they have on that. Yep. Thank you, that's it for me. Okay, great. That's it. Any yes. Uh, for the uh, 1042, how much of that money is coming from what the federal government- 100% of it is FEMA reimbursable. So that's why we do a full contract. It makes it a lot easier for us to actually put it right in through our FEMA grant and give them all the data. And I can share with you all of that data that's requested from FEMA. We did prepare a presentation, but in this room, I, I thought we were gonna be in another, like mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking it was in this room. Um, but I can share with you the presentation we prepared on like cost uh, against the, you know, it's about a hundred and something dollars per uh, person we vaccinated and um, I, can, I can get all that. And on the tableau for uh, the Jersey City COVID testing, is that uh, the doses administered, it says doses administered in Jersey City, is that bespoke health or is yes. that in total That's like? total just bespoke health. Okay. So the first page is total people registered as city residents that are vaccinated in our city. That's page one that comes directly from the Department of Health from New Jersey. They track everyone in the New Jersey um, immunization surveillance system, and we get that data, we upload it to our Tableau. The second page is bespoke only work, because Municipal in the beginning efforts. we had, um, the medical center, all of the hospitals and healthcare systems vaccines. Okay. So that's, that's representative of all. Anyone else? Does this make any changes to the vaccination sites we have now or is it go towards the- No, not current changes. What, what, what current changes can occur or when you request to me mobile locations. So what we normally do and, and what you'll see 
is um, we want to be in every ward, every opportunity. These particular locations that we have exist because somebody gave us the space. So Pershing Field we own, Connor Center we own, the Bethune Center we own, Gallo Center we're in a partnership with the county because they want to get people vaccinated. And at the same time we're doing vaccinations, the county is offering testing. Um, what you'll see in the testing is like partners like Monumental Church, St. Paul's, uh, Moose Lodge, who've offered us a space for about a week. We also have a mobile unit um, that operates under Office of Emergency Management. So when there's not another emergency under public safety, we get to utilize that vehicle for vaccines and we can bring that anywhere. It's got Wi-Fi, it's got everything we need. And we, we practice during some of the warmer months, a lot of activity in the community. And so we see as the weather right now is not as great, um, we're actually go, we go into senior housing and do vaccines in senior housing. So we just finished a round of vaccines in senior housing and the Jersey City Housing Authority. Uh, and then we'll go back. So this month we're doing testing in Jersey City senior housing and Jersey City Housing Authority. And then we'll go back the next month and do vaccines in those locations. We have, um, with regards to the numbers, I know you said uh, we were in 80 percentile, but is the breakdown, is it ward specific? It's ward specific on the uh, tableau and it's, and it's race and ethnicity specific with a, a large unknown population people who did not identify. Oh, and, oh, and with respect to the mobile uh, vaccine, how do we deploy that? Um, well, we do it based on activity, so each ward um, has a health educator assigned to it. So when you go through orientation, we share with you your health educator. When there's an activity going on in your ward, you can request support from the health department. And that comes in many ways. So that comes in if you want the health bus there to do outreach, if there's homeless uh, population, vaccine outreach, education outreach, PPB, PPE deployment and or a table. All of those things we can provide. You just let us know if there's an activity. If there's an agency we're already working with in your ward, they'll ask us. So typically, uh, Greenville Neighborhood Association works across both A and F, and every time they have an event, we bring a vaccine truck, or we bring a vaccine table, or we're doing, we have a health um, component of their events. Okay. Whatever those are, we have a team from both Bespoke and the Division of Community Health and Wellness. Any more questions? Question. Okay. Um, regarding testing, is the city paying for each test that happens or, or, or is Bespoke so essentially uh, charging the insurance? <laughs> or can you explain how so, all of that um, works? Everything we do with Bespoke does not charge insurance. 100% the work we do with Bespoke does not charge insurance. According to the US federal government, any PCR test must be free to the public and the provider can charge insurance for PCR testing. Rapid testing is not included in that unless your medical provider says, I believe you have symptoms and I'm going to ask for a rapid test for you which is why you've noticed the CDMDs having a lot of people there because they do rapid testing with a medical provider saying there's a rapid test and if you had a symptom, it could be charged against insurance. Nothing we do is charged against insurance. Many partners that we, we don't have the capacity, we don't have the medical team to be doing testing. We don't have that number of nurses. I mean, currently we have four nurses at the health department uh, and they're working on lead prevention efforts and STD and immunization for families to get them back into schools. So with bespoke vaccines and testing we do with bespoke is 100% free and no charge to any insurance. Partner sites out across the city that come to the health department send us information of what they're doing and the labs that they're using and their CLIA, which is the clinical waiver for them to operate outside of their medical facility to do that work. 
That is cleared through a health inspector, or an RHS, that's the Regional Environmental Health Specialist. If you all know Lawrence Siron, uh, he's the one who's point on that. He's a former doctor. He's in, uh, has a lot of experience in this, and they work alongside Dr. Bastola, our health officer. Those people are allowed to charge insurance. So what I mentioned earlier is, if someone doesn't get a test result for 11 days, like to me, charging someone's insurance 11 days post-test would be insurance fraud, because they need the test within 10 days to understand their isolation or quarantining for their family. So therefore, we would say those things outside of the normal delays in the lab is not justifiable for people to charge insurance. However, no one should pay out of pocket. Everybody's insurance will cover testing and will cover as many tests as they need as far as PCR. I guess um, this question, it's almost have almost nothing to do with it, but um, are we doing anything with regards to vaccine education? Yes. So because we, yeah, we have a team. Like I said earlier, there's someone in each ward. We've been developing videos. We've been working with clergy. Um, we've been getting clerical support from the Jersey City Housing Authority. We've been doing direct education there. And, and so every place where we see there's like an issue, particularly for us, um, you know, we, we've reached out to leaders in that particular community saying like, we have a problem here. Can you come help us do a workshop there? So, say for instance, if we see that um, the city is in the 80 percentile, but we see in Ward F that it's in like the 45 percentile, then education efforts will be focused in that area with community leaders and community groups yes. in that area. And, and we've been, since the beginning of COVID, um, we've worked very closely with the clergy in that community, and we actually have very high, um, you know, vaccine uptake in 07305. Um, and so we want to like work with, most of the people we work with are the seniors in the community who are great mentors to others. Uh, and in fact, I was, I was telling uh, the BA, I got a phone call from, I'm, I'm surprised she's not here to speak, but Miss Laverne Washington, who's often here, she's an advocate. Um, she called me this morning. She's like, we gotta get back out there. We've got more to do, and so she'll come and pick up PPE and uh, items that are necessary for the community, and we'll coordinate um, with her either a vaccine workshop or uh, a vaccine location on a particular day, and so we, we continue to do that. Thank you, Stacy. Yeah. I have two more questions. Oh, You'd... two more. Okay, go ahead. I'll just, I'll just lump it into one, um, and thank you for your patience. You know, I know. The public is really interested in this because we are in the middle of, you know, the fourth wave. Right. Um, how are we holding those partner sites accountable that have delayed in testing? And also, on the flip side, I've seen pop-up sites that didn't go through Dr. Bastola or Lawrence uh, Ciron. And what are we doing regarding those yes. uh, sites? So two both questions. good questions. I don't know. I don't so. When there's an issue in particular, I sent everything from a closure of a pop-up site to a closure of a restaurant in your ward, I will send you via email and I copy the council president and the closest uh, at-large ward member to that area. So oftentimes, and this occurred particular in, in several locations, in the last two or three weeks. Um, this is why we got a little bit more strict and we're holding some people, you know, right now, um, we're either, uh, there were some sites that were telling people they just popped up in front of some supermarkets, um, took people's information, people didn't get their, their results. So we followed up with all the information given to us from those individuals, um, we then, are working with the municipal prosecutor, and then he is working with the attorney general's office uh, to see like what kind of recourse we have there, which is why we put out a large sort of 
social media campaign of only use the locations that are vetted by us. So I, the mayor received an email today with a long list of where a, a woman had gone for many to seek tests and these places were closed one day or not open. Uh, those weren't locations vetted by us. The locations vetted by us um, do have some lab delays right now. And if the lab delays are extraneous, like outside, like we said, the 72 hour right now, we're offering, that's why we're offering these rapid tests right now. All the rapid testing we're doing right now is funded through FEMA. Um, and we, but we can't guarantee people some PCR results because we don't run the labs. Um, and so we're offering anyone who's had a delayed result a priority. And so if you get them to us, we'll get them in. Uh, and then we follow up with the municipal prosecutor, the, the health officer, and the health officer can bring it up to the state uh, and or the prosecutor to the attorney general. And there's a few labs that we're uh, monitoring closely right now. Great. Last question. Do you have a question? No? Okay. Thank you, Stacy. Right. Brian. Good evening, Council. Uh, Brian Weller, Director, Division of Architecture. Three resolutions to go over. Uh, first one is 10.24. Uh, this resolution is authorizing the City of Jersey City to apply for and accept grant funding from the Hudson County Open Space Recreation and Historic Preservation Trust Fund for Pavonia Marion Park. Brian, we can't hear you clear. Sorry. No. Maybe this will help. Mm -hmm. Repeat it. 10.24. 10 10.24. Go over that again. 10.24. 10.24. It's a resolution authoring, authorizing the state of Jer uh, the city of Jersey City to apply and accept for grant funding from Hudson County Open Space Recreation and Historic Preservation Trust Fund for Pavonia Marion Park. It's a pretty standard grant application that we, the city typically does annually. Question. Go ahead. Um, so I, re I see in the resolution that it authorizes another uh, million, 1.6 million in funding through capital funding from the city. Would there be a separate resolution for that or is there, is just stating, uh, is this a commitment for that expenditure as well as receiving the grant funding. That is actually the capital funding that was set aside for the park. So, so the grant funding would be used 100% for that. And if, if we get really good bid results, um, that capital funding stays available for other open space projects. Thank you. Anyone else? Next one, Brian. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, agenda item number 10.25. This is a resolution authorizing the award of a professional services contract to MKW and Associates in connection with the preliminary assessment, design, development, and construction documents for the Arlington Park Improvements Project. Again, this, this project was capitally funded and we put out an RFP to be competitive and um, it just so happens that although we're not regulated, to going with the lowest responsible professional, uh, MKW came up as the, the best respondent. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Okay, last one, uh, agenda item 10.26. It's a resolution authorizing the award of a professional services contract to RDS Associates Consulting Engineers Incorporated in connection with the architectural engineering services for the Municipal Services Complex Police Training Facility for the city. Yeah. So we're building a police training facility. <laughs> Where is this, Brian? Uh, <laughs> this is this is at the uh, Municipal Services Complex. Uh, it's it's currently the building at the at the entrance. Um, it was the old Liberty Storage Facility.
Well, it sounds yeah. I'll, I'll be able to provide some additional information. So uh, with the absence of a uh, shooting range in Hudson County, um, this would help facilitate that. And uh, we're looking more of a de-escalation center. Uh, this is just for the uh, engineering and architecture work to see what the build out can be of that building. But um, the long-term vision, and we'll bring it back to council with the plans uh, prior to approval, would be a de-escalation center, which includes the uh, ammunition uh, part of it, as well as uh, classrooms, active uh, drills, uh, kind of a one-stop shop, which would help uh, our police and ESU um, facilitate more safer community-involved uh, training. Um, so the programming will come back to the council. This is just a, a preliminary understanding of what the building and the facility can hold. And, uh, you know, can we go two floors? Do we have to stay one? Um, you know, and we also have the records retention uh, process that in that as well, where we have to see, you know, bulletproof um, walls and, you know, all that type of stuff. So this is just a preliminary build out of that. And this was uh, in the pre-approved capital projects from last year. Any questions? I don't have a question. I just have a statement. So just to be clear, this is just for when officers are going to go qualify more than anything, correct? That's the preliminary idea here, but uh, we are also going to have uh, classrooms uh, for additional training, um, maybe some real life, uh, you know, um, facilities where they stage pullover, uh, um, you know, that type of uh, vehicle stops, that type of stuff. Anyone else? Anyone else? Would this present a, a cost saving to the city ultimately? Like, has there been a analysis done? Yeah, so we'll be able to speak uh, more broadly once we look at the, um, the, what the capability of the facility is, but um, there is a cost benefit to the city knowing that we would be the only facility in Hudson County with this type of uh, um, program in which other cities would then pay us to use these facilities. So mm -hmm. um, we, just, we don't want to speak on that until we know what the capabilities are, but there's definitely a, a possibility for us to have a program with other uh, municipalities and the sheriff's department, uh, maybe even the state police. I mean, you know, it, it could be wide ranged in which the city would benefit cost. Sounds good, thank you. Quick question. Um, so this is, this facility would serve as, I guess, additional training for existing officers. It's not per se a police academy. That's correct, that would be uh, ongoing. Uh, the police department has to requalify annually um, you know, with their uh, weapon. And then, you know, the future de-escalation would be annually as well. Anyone else? Thank you, Brian. Okay, thank you, Council. I just wanna make a statement. Um, when the directors or whoever is coming to present, we can read the title, but we want more detail. Okay, I just want to make that clear because they're coming up here reading the title and saying, well, it speaks for itself. We know it speaks for itself, but you got new council people here who really don't know process. And so the purpose of this caucus is to really explain the process. That's what we're here for. So moving forward, give more information, okay? We can read the titles, but we want more information, all right? Even though you sent it out, but that's the purpose of the caucus. And this way here, everybody can learn. That's what it is about, learning how the process of the city works. All right? Paul. How are you, Council? Fine. How you doing, Paul? Good. My name's Paul Russo, Director of Engineering, Traffic, and Transportation. I will not be reading the title, but it's 10-11. <laughs> So this is uh, authorizing the award for a contract of uh, Ravex, and this is the Johnston Avenue Road Improvements. For the council that we were previously working with, <clears throat> you've probably seen this one before. This is actually the third time this went out to bid, but we got some really, really good numbers here. Excuse uh, me, Paul. Yep. 10.11. Okay, let us know what resolution number and ordinance number, okay? Got it. So Go it's ahead. agenda number 10.11, resolution 22-16. So for the council that, that we were working with previously, you probably remember this Johnston Avenue, it was talked about for well over a year now, 
because uh, it went out to bid two separate occasions that we did not award. Um, it is a federal project, so with federal projects, there's a lot more loopholes. Um, they're a lot stricter with paperwork. If something is not included from the bidders, it's automatically rejected. Um, so during the first two times that we did this over the last year, uh, we were not able to award this project. This time we did get really good numbers. Um, it will be totally grant funded, so we have about $2 million from this federal grant funding, uh, and it will um, fully fund the project on Johnston Avenue from Grand Street to Phillip Street. So it's a normal road um, reconstruction, as well as updating all of the ADA compliant handicap ramps. Um, it will be improving intersections with signals. Uh, it will be doing all of the, the milling and resurfacing for a nice smooth surface of the road. Uh, we'll be doing decorative uh, street lights and regulatory signs, uh, streetscaping improvements, striping, uh, castings, drainage improvements, and everything that entails in a normal uh, road reconstruction such as this. What's the estimated timeline for completion? So we would shoot to get this started as soon as possible. I think it was a 280 day calendar day. <laughs> Um, so the contractor has 280 days. If we get him awarded and get him started as soon as the weather breaks, we would shoot to finish by the end of this year. Just because I know there are supply chain issues, but you know, that sounds good. Yep. Done in the year. How, how would this um, affect the traffic pattern? So this wouldn't have any drastic, um, there wouldn't be a drastic change. Uh, we're not doing any road diet where we're changing, you know, from two lanes to one or anything drastic where, where we're changing the layout of the road lanes. Um, it, it would be pretty consistent with how, how it's operated now. Um, so it wouldn't, it wouldn't have a drastic uh, change for travel. Okay, and I guess this question is pretty much for all the presenters. Um, What's the exact metric that you guys use when you're determining these contracts? Because for the most part, when I'm looking at it, it's always the lowest bidder. And um, a lot of times, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's the, the best quality of work or we're not getting the best bank file buck, so to say. Um, so what is, what is the metric that you use when you're coming to the final conclusion? Sure, so that, that isn't up to us to decide. Um, this is a public bid and it's using grant funding. So we have to go with the lowest responsible bidder on something like this, on something that it is more of a professional services. Um, you can debate that and have more of a discussion, um, but this is almost apples to apples where every single person is bidding on a very specific thing. So everybody is doing an 18 inch concrete uh, vertical curb. So you can't really argue that this contractor will do it much better than this contractor, so they should have to pay something different. Um, with something that's like this, where it's a public bid, you have to go with the responsible low. Okay. Learn something new. Of course. So, so Councilman, I think it's important to understand when he says responsible low is bidder, that they're pre-qualified, they're professionals, they have all their professional certificates, and that uh, you know we did due diligence to make sure that they do qualify to do the work. And then, as Paul said, uh, it, it goes down to price based on the, uh, the general specs. Correct. And for contractors that do um, run into issues where they, they don't do positive work, they could be debarred, um, and they wouldn't even be capable of bidding on projects such as this. Quick question. Is the design... Um does design match what's uh, called on for Johnson Avenue in the Bike Master Plan? I believe it does, and what we can do, so I, I'm just finishing up kind of a 2021 um, completion year in review that I'd like to send out to the entire council. Uh, I will definitely do that before the end of the week. Uh, and then what we're also going to do is do something that, that I've done in the past where I do a 2022 look ahead and it goes into not just this project, but all the upcoming projects that we're going to do in 2022. This way, everybody's on the same page and they can use that 
kind of package as a frame of reference for everything moving forward. Councilman, um, there, because there are several different funders for this specific project, we had to combine a federal grant that we got from the FHWA and an NJTPA grant. There's a portion of it where we couldn't advance the exact design where we had that we had in the bike master plan, and so our plan is to uh, continue with the project, stripe it the way it is, upgrade all the crosswalks, et cetera, keep the existing striping, and then to come back and upgrade it consistently with the bike master plan. So there's going to be a portion where the striping is exactly the way it is now, and then soon after we'll come back and switch it. And it was just because of a limitation of the of the funders. Yeah, so the, once the project is closed out, you then go back to ownership and you're allowed to, you know, change whatever you need to. We'll just, we'll, that'll just buy us some time also to go to the community and present that design and, and see if we have support for it before we advance that. Got it. Okay. Anyone else? Thank well, you, Paul. Thank you, Council. Jennifer? Jennifer Cato um, from the Division of Traffic and Transportation. I'm here to present one resolution, um, agenda number 10.10, .10, resolution 22-015. Um, this is to transfer the ownership and maintenance of the traffic signal at um, Central Ave and Hoboken Avenue from the DOT to the city. It was originally a um, unsignalized intersection and a signal was constructed by DOT during the construction or reconstruction of um, Route 139. Mm -hmm. After reconstruction was completed, um, the DOT had plans to remove the signal and we asked that we kept the signal up to keep the operations and um, maintain the safety at that intersection. Questions? Jennifer, question. Sure. So with respect to that, uh, to any of those uh, traffic lights on 139, is there a way we could just, and I'm not sure if, if you're the one who can answer this, but is there any way we could put the maximum amount of seconds uh, for those traffic lights, or is that strictly the state that has to do that? Um, that would be under the state, um, and you're asking to have the maximum amount of green time on. So that they can cross. Oh, that they can cross um, for, for vehicles or pedestrians. 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 We can definitely, and we have been in contact with the, the DOT to improve the signals and crossing times for pedestrians, and we'll continue to do so. But that would be under the state jurisdiction. Anyone else? Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Nicole. Good evening, Council. I'm here to present um, agenda no item number 10.23, resolution number 22-028. This is for the award of a contract to PNA Administrative Services. PNA is our third party administrative company. They currently handle our COBRA billing for um, employees and employee dependents that have recently lost coverage. They also handle our COBRA statements for onboarded employees, as well as retiree billing for medical prescription and dental. And they also handle our cafeteria plan, FSA, a flexible spending account. Any questions? Go ahead, Nicole, next one. Okay. Next item would be 10.39. This uh, resolution number 22-044. This is to exercise the last of two additional option years for our medical program with Horizon Blue Cross and Blue Shield, providing all active employee and retiree medical benefits. Any questions? Go ahead, Jennifer, the next one. I mean, Nicole, next one. Okay, next one would be 10.40, resolution number 22-045. 
This one is also a contract to enter into a contract with Horizon Blue Cross and Blue Shield to provide our open dental plan, our plan that provides $1,300 annual maximum coverage for active civilian employees and $2,000 maximum coverage for active police and fire. Has this plan changed since last year or is this new or can Same plan. Same plan, mm -hmm. okay. Any questions? Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Nicole. Okay, last one would be 10.41, resolution 22.046. This one is for Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield to orchestrate our closed dental plan. Same plan, this is the same plan for all civilians and uh, active police and fire. Questions? Thank you, Nicole. Thank you very much. Carl? Good evening, Council. I'm Kyle Greaves from Office of Management, Management and Budget. Um, I have two resolutions for you, 10.1 um, being the calendar year 2022 temporary budget. Um, this is a requirement by the local budget law for us to temporarily appropriate funding for approximately the first quarter of the year, um, potentially to get us to the point of adoption, adopting the budget. Um, so the figures you see there are kind of estimates based off the adopted budget from last year. Um, and that as if, if we need funding throughout the rest of the year, um, that'll come to council as well to increase those amounts. So this is standard uh, procedure. Mm -hmm. Is there any questions? Go ahead, Dan. Just confirming, Kyle, that this is the, uh, I think it's always a 25% plus one for each yeah, quarter? It's 26.25% um, of prior year appropriate. Prior year budget. Yeah. And there's no deviations from that, that's just a uniform across the board. Yeah, it, it excludes our debt service and uh, any grants and special, special appropriations as well. Great, thanks. Uh, the next item is 10.38, resolution to cancel current appropriation reserve balances. So the council approved um, an ordinance at the end of 2021 for a $10 million special emergency to pay for our uh, contractual uh, severances, such as sick time, holiday time, and anything paid out to separated employees. Um, this resolution will cancel the unused balance since the ordinance was an estimated amount. And what that'll do, it's an accounting mechanism. So in future budget years, um, it'll decrease our deferred charge um, over the next uh, five years. That's all. Questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Joanne? Happy New Year. 10.37, resolution number 22-042, a resolution appointing Trish Greco as the tax collector. I will be finally taking my retirement very soon, March 31st. So Trish is handpicked. She's been here before as an assistant. Uh, th thanks, Joanne. First off, uh, thank you for your service to the city. And uh, we, we congratulate you on your retirement. Uh, council, we're presenting this tonight. Uh, Trish has had over 19 years of service in the tax office. Um, preliminarily, um, we did a search and uh, she did uh, apply for the position. Um, one of the specialties that uh, Trish has, which most uh, tax collectors in the state don't have, is her expertise in pilots, which obviously the city has over 140 active pilots. Um, for the tax collector position, it is a uh, state license, so uh, the, the eligibility pool revolves around individuals that do have that state-appointed license. And uh, I bring this to council now uh, with uh, uh, Director Sisk retiring in March that uh, we have a transition period in which uh, if Trish is appointed uh, by the council, we do have some uh, time to make sure it runs seamlessly uh, with the first quarter of bills uh, being presented uh, right around the same time of her retirement. So um, just wanted to kind of give any information and if uh, Trish would like to say anything. Um, I have 19 years experience. I worked in Jersey City for college um, as the assistant tax collector. Um, I wanted to further my career. So I left Jersey City to be the tax collector in Lacey Township where I've been five years. 
Um, and when I heard Joanne was retiring, I wanted to come back. Um, Jersey City being the largest municipality next to Newark. Um, more experience, more challenges, and I just look forward to working here, coming back to my home, basically. Well, I'll tell you, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It, it's good to see someone with uh, New Jersey City work history, you know. Uh, Joanne, you'll be missed, you know. Thank you for your service here. I, I just have one, one when, I, when, I, um, when I got the resolution, uh, you just brought me back to uh, Maureen Cosgrove. You know, I remember seeing you down there. And uh, I'm sure I know the answer to this, uh, but I just have a question specific to you. And it's, can you tell me what you'll do to ensure the best customer service for the residents of the city of Jersey City? Um, I like to cross train. I like the employees to know each other's job. I, I don't like when one person knows this job and then they can't assist you if they're on vacation. So cross training is a big thing for me. Um, how I relate to the taxpayers, I sympathize with them. It's more of a proactive response instead of being, a, being reactive. So I sympathize with them. I, you know, you basically tell them, we all pay taxes because most of the time they're complaining their taxes are too high. So we just try to be proactive with them. Uh, Trish, I just have one comment. We're bigger than Newark. Right. <laughs> Trish, you said you left and came back? Uh, I worked here for 19 years, okay. and now I'm the tax collector in Lacey, which is only 17,000 line items, very small town uh -huh. in Ocean County. Okay. Um, and I didn't come back. I actually, I applied for the job, so it's up to you guys if you appoint me or not. <laughs> I'm just curious, um, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a key person I'm promoting within. There's no one in that office that can move up the ladder? I'm just curious because she does, you know, she works someplace else right now, if I'm correct. Yeah, sure, uh, Councilwoman. So uh, we do only have one other employee in, in, the, uh, in the office down there that does have the professional license. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went through an application process, and uh, Trish was one of the outside individuals that applied. Mm -hmm. uh, to be frank, as you know, I retired from Bayonne and came to Jersey City with 25 years experience. Mm -hmm. And it was a challenge for myself. Uh, it took some time, but it was a challenge. I would never recommend a <clears throat> rookie, as you would say, to come into Jersey City to hold the office of certified tax collector. You have to have some experience. Um, Trish comes with six years experience as a tax collector, mm -hmm. not to mention the experience with Jersey City as the assistant. but. I would not recommend someone who's never held the position of tax collector before. Thank you. I understand that, but like I said, my concern is always promoting within. And just like you said, when you came over here, you know, it, it took you some time. And right. you had experience based on, if I remember correctly, when you came to Jersey City. I did. I, right. I had 25 years so you experience. You see, it's, it's, it's something getting used to an yeah. office like that. And she's coming from a smaller office. So um, I do have my concerns, I do. I, and like I said, I'm one for promoting within. I, b I believe that um, I be people who've been working there for decades and- it, know, It's difficult for me because I'm here for three more months and I respect my employees very much and I respect the ones that hold the certificate, but I ask you to respect my um, expertise that the employees who could hold the position are just not qualified and not ready. It, he said it, there's one. And, sh and it is he my said opinion. The BA said there's one that can apply. So uh, I'm just trying to be one, fair one now. One had the license. Uh, one had the license. The, 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 we have two now. Valerie also has the license, but she actually stepped down as a tax collector in Irvington and does not want the position. Um, also, the other employee has also stated she wants no part of the position, which is probably the first thing I should have said. And uh, what, what uh, jurisdiction are you coming from again? Or what do you currently work? I was the assistant tax collector in Jersey City. 
when I received my license. So I was in Jersey City for 19 years. And then the tax collector had no intention of retiring. So I wanted to pursue my career and be a tax collector. So I left Jersey City as the assistant tax collector. And I went to Lisi Township, which is in Ocean County. Now, with regards to that jurisdiction in Jersey City, because um, you said it was, it wasn't, I guess it, how does the municipalities compare to each other with respect well, to value? I worked in Jersey City, so I, I have the experience of being in a large town, so I know the basics of how to run the town finances with the tax collection part. And I also, um, within the different municipalities, they use different programs, so not everyone knows which program each municipality uses. The program that we use in Lacey Township is the same program that Jersey City uses. And we've implemented the um, iCloud software, so that's something that I would pursue in switching to if I came here. Okay, and um, also, how, how do we know what you're going to ensure um, like a cohesive working environment? Um, I'm a former, well, I guess I'm a current city employee on elected level, but I used to work in um, other city entities, and um, I'm very big on leadership pretty much dictating and setting the tone for the entire office. H how do we know you're going to ensure a fair and equitable work environment? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how we ever know that. Mm -hmm. we, we, we interview and we take references. And I want, I want to hear from her. OK. Well, I have to get to know the employees. I don't know the employees there. All the, the employees that worked there when I was there, most of them left. But like I said, I'm a team player. Teamwork is the key for me. Everyone doing each other's job, um, being cross-trained. That's what I was looking mm -hmm. for, the word team player. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you don't really, you don't have to know someone personally to treat them fairly and Absolutely. be just. Right. And cross-training is a big thing for me, too. Because if, say, I have, especially with COVID, you have people calling out, you know, sick. I want everyone else to know how to do that person's job so that we are capable of completing the work when others are out. We don't do that now? VA. We don't, they don't cross train now. I'm, I'm just trying to figure this out because they I've been cross, this sometimes. Yes, they cross train. They are. Yes, the only issue, most, most, they can mostly do everyone else's job. The only issue was pilots because they are sensitive, but we actually have someone else now cross training with our, our pilot um, uh, person in charge of pilots in my office right now so that we have at least two and Trish would be a third. Mm -hmm. I just want to say one thing. It's important to me that you know this. I have a work ethic that I'm, I, all right, I'm going, it's not my problem. No, absolutely not. I never met Ms. Greco. I didn't know who she was. I seeked out with phone calls, different tax collectors, because as you know, there was quite a mess here when I came in. And I really like to take I don't usually do this, pat myself on the back, but I worked very hard and you have a, it's good right now. It's very good. The morale is good. The taxpayers were getting more and more compliments on how they're being treated. And um, so I just wanted to let you know that to, you know, put some trust in me a little bit that I definitely, definitely did my research. Hey Joyce. Um... Do we have the options to, to meet before you appoint in individuals? Uh, like to, to have like, yeah. because this is on for Wednesday, right? Yeah, we can table it. Yeah, because I, I mean, I would really like the option to um, just, you know, sit and speak because it's really hard for me to just be voting to appoint someone. There's nothing against you, you know, it's just, it's really hard for me to oblige to appoint someone that I haven't met with at length, that I haven't talked to, that I don't know the background. I mean, you went to Hudson, I went to Hudson, you went to Rutgers, I went to Rutgers, but I mean, that's all I know. Okay. All right. We can wait. Uh, Mary, you have something to say? I, I have heard some good things about you from people who have been involved with the city, but knowing the number of issues we have had with this department, 
I think that's some of the, um, I don't want to speak for other council people, but for me, I want to move very cautiously and methodically and making sure we get the right person in for the right job. Um, Bia, you had mentioned that there would be an interim period, but the resolution actually says that the appointment is for the full four years, so how does, like, how does that work? Uh, thank you, uh, Councilwoman. So um, at this time, uh, Director Sisk has the, uh, the title. Um, when the council considers this, um, she would give her uh, title up. She would become a regular management employee until retirement, and uh, the new director would uh, would serve um, at that uh, yeah at that title. Um, the four year uh, piece of it is uh, that it mirrors directors that the term would be four years expiring with the mayor. Mm. Mm. That's your concern until we exactly speak to her and speak to the staff. Let me put my microphone on so everybody can hear everything for the record. That, I think that, that that's really just, just the big piece of it for me, knowing, knowing how important this department is, knowing that we're also not out of COVID and that we're going to have a lot of people that are going to have a lot of issues with their homes, with their rents, and with everything else. It's still, like, that's a big piece of it. So we just want to make sure for me that we're just, we're, we're taking the time we need to sit down, Trisha, and talk with you and, mm -hmm. uh, like, better understand your philosophy around some of these questions we have. So, because John, um, you can see part of the concern with the council. They would like to really sit down and talk with her personally. Um, maybe yeah, I mean, uh, we'll have that, uh, you know, at, at what, however the council would like to handle. Yeah. And uh, we, I'd also like to bring in uh, Director Gandula in those meetings because uh, she'll serve okay. as tax collector uh, director. So okay, so. Impor uh, it's important uh, that you see the management strategy from the top down. We got it. Um, so. So with that, we could uh, bring it back at the next meeting. Could we? Thank yeah. you. All right, and then I'll work with the council to, uh, I don't know if we do something virtual or in person, but I'll, I'll talk to the council president on, on how to handle that. Nothing personal, nothing. I Believe me, we, we've been through this with these departments a while. We're just exhausted now. So Sean, for the record, I will uh, ask to remove this from the agenda on Wednesday. Uh, I'll work with the council president on setting something up for a longer conversation point, and we'll bring it back at the, at the following meeting. Thank you, Bia. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Director Kears. Thank you. Good evening, President Waterman, members of the council. I'm here to stay to speak on eight resolutions from both uh, the Office of Emergency Management and also the Department of Public Works. First one being 10.15 uh, Resolution 22020, and that's regarding the renewal of um, with a company that performs uh, some of our moving services. As we're all aware, we've had uh, quite a bit of movement of offices throughout the city. This company is bonded, they're insured. Uh, basically, we use them for large scale moving events. Uh, delicate items such as electronic items and things like that, and they will be supplementing uh, our folks out at the workforce at Public Works. Any questions? Director, do you know how much you anticipate spending on this contract this year? I'm sorry, Councilman. Sure. Do you know how much you anticipate spending on this contract this I, year? I don't have it. I didn't bring the actual resolution, but I know this year uh, we use them tremendously, repopulating City Hall and other locations. Um, most of the movement for the big most part is done by our labor folks. Pretty much we use these for large scale moves and as I say delicate items such as uh, electronic items and things like that because they're all bonded and insured. Anyone else? Moving forward, 10.16, 22, 021. And this is to supplement our salting and plowing uh, operations with Ken Marine and Bayonne. There again, these are open competitive bids. Um, we had uh, just one responder to this bid, who was Ken's Marine. And what happens is, is during this last storm, we had approximately 60 pieces of equipment on the street. So we, uh, their services were not required. Should we get uh, a large storm, 8, 10, 12 inches of snow, we would bring them in to supplement our operations. Any questions? You, it was only one respondent to the, to the contract you said? That's correct. Oh, 
Do we know, um, do we know why? Well, the city uses BidSync, uh, which is their bidding process. So a lot of companies we find are reluctant to register on that. Um, so what we'll do, we'll go out for two rounds on the bid sync, and then after that, we can open it up to uh, just a, uh, a, we try and get as many local bidders as we can. But that's part of the purchase and procurement uh, process the city uses. Anyone else? I had a question regarding the uh, Ford Explorers. Um, do we have, uh, are they going to be allocated towards anything specific? Um, because I know the rec department needs like a, a vehicle for the summer program. I don't know if, um, you know, we can account for that. Councilor, I'm sorry, I couldn't. Un sorry, I couldn't are the Ford Explorers uh, in the previous uh, resolution being allocated towards anything in particular or is it just, uh, you know, resupply? That's resolution, uh, Ten you wanna to touch on that now? Yeah, sorry, I was, I was gonna ask that. Yeah, that's 1020-22-025. That's Right now, they're just being used to uh, replace vehicles that have uh, extended their usefulness. We've had a lot of vehicles in the past that's far uh, exceeded mileage and, and uh, the service wasn't always up to par. So I think uh, right now it's, it's probably moving in that direction where you'll be seeing this and other vehicles uh, as we've done uh, some surveys and things of that nature, uh, upgrading our snow equipment and other equipment like that. Yeah, uh, Councilman, these are replacing uh, 2010 and 2013 uh, vehicles, which uh, with DPW and, and uh, their facilities working sometimes 12, 18 hours a day, um, they're past their useful life. And, you know, we always try to take a look at what the repairs are versus what the new, uh, the new equipment would be and the maintenance. So, uh, you know, at, at a certain point, you just decide you're not going to keep rebuilding an old vehicle. It makes more sense to, to uh, invest in a new one. Thank you. Welcome. Anyone else? Uh, moving on to 1017, 20-22, mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, with uh, <clears throat> same thing, control services, Ken's Marine, that's and Shark, S-H-A-R-K transportation. This is related to our citywide snow removal operations. Um, fortunately, we haven't encountered uh, that type of uh, an event over the last few years, but um, as anybody can recall, back there in the uh, 14, 15, 2015, 2016, we had snow uh, totaling 12, 15, 18 inches at a time. Uh, what happens with this is that this is the heavy equipment that's required, the large-scale tandem dumps, uh, plows and things of that nature, uh, backhoes, that we would come in to ensure that we're able to clear this heavy snow from our main uh, roadways to ensure uh, opening up for transportation. Anyone else? Any questions? That's it. Okay, great. 10-18 is uh, authorizing award for relevant the Rabo street sweepers. Um, these are specialized sweepers that were bought several years ago, um, and it requires specific maintenance more so than our Elgins. We are actually upgrading uh, the sweepers. Uh, unfortunately, with the supply demand, that's going to be several months before we receive these. These are the sweepers that are used on the uh, for the most part, the nine primary streets. Um, so it requires separate maintenance, and uh, that's is why we have to redo it until we get the new sweepers, which will we'll be gradually phasing these out when the new ones come in and also attempting to sell them uh, to any other agency that's willing to buy them. Any questions? Uh, let's see. 10.6. That's uh, 10.19. 22-024, and this is a uh, contract award to Lawson Products. Basically, Lawson Products is a supplier of various sundries, uh, screws, bolts, um, electrical parts, things like that, mostly small parts that's used uh, throughout all of the trades in uh, public works. Any questions? Uh, the last one we have is 10-21, 22-026. And this is a water contract to General Plumbing for various plumbing supplies that by use that's used by our uh, city plumbers. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. That's it, right? Well, I don't have any more slips. All right. I don't have anyone else. Any more slips, Juju? Okay.
That's what, yeah, did the director do 1022? No, that's public. That's public. So we can. OEM, though. Director. 10.22. Did the barricades, Greg? Oh, most important, OEM. Um, yes, this is a, um, what we are doing is purchasing, you probably have seen them in other locales. Um, DOT, the barricades that we used closing many of the streets, the uh, bicycle ride barricades are really not approved for road usage. Uh, it was cost prohibitive to actually build the wooden ones. This company, Robco, we've dealt with them in the past. And what we're doing is buying these, uh, well, they're lightweight plastic barricades that are clearly marked. They're used for traffic operations. During uh, storm events and things like that, when we experience flooding, we have about 20 or 30 intersections throughout the city. So what we would do is deploy these barricades at the locations, and then the police officers, as the roadways have to be closed, they could use them to close them. High, highly visible and in compliance with uh, NJDOT rules and regulations. And this is funded through the UASI grant. Other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Have a nice night. Thank you. That's it. Anything else? No one else is here. Council Perez, there's no one else uh, presenting. I think we have members of the, the arts and culture trust. Arts. But do you want them to go before we yeah, finish business? We finish. Okay. Because you said they have our um, meeting, right? Yeah, they have a meeting at 530. 530. Yeah. Come on. Let them present, and then we'll finish, Sean, because they have a meeting at 530. Hi. I'm Angelica Sanchez. I co-chair the Arts Committee Trust Fund with Liz Phillips-Lorenzo. We just want to give you a brief overview of what we've been working on and what we hope to accomplish. Um, we recognize our responsibility to the taxpayers and want to make this process as transparent as possible. We also want to make sure that a diverse group of artists are represented from all wards. Um, we want to meet individually with all the council members, um, all voting members of our committee, and, and me and Liz would like to meet with the three at large uh, individually also. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Liz uh, for any questions you may have. Okay. Good evening. Oh, sorry. You're taller than me. Sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Great. Um, Happy New Year and good evening, Council President and Council Members. Um, like my co-chair said, we are the new committee for the Arts and Culture Fund, which is the money that has been agreed upon to be set aside for arts and culture throughout the Jersey City. And each one of us are actually, the voting members all represent a different ward in each of the, each state, in each in the city. So I'm Ward F, so Councilman, I need to meet with you. And then of course the council, um, council members at large. But our goal is to actually get as many interested artists, art nonprofits and art businesses to apply for this application. We are hoping to begin advertising as early as mid-January, February. So we're asking for each of you, if you have, since you have relationships with constituents, to actually schedule time with us to just tell us who we need to reach out to to make sure we can reach as many individuals as possible because this is our first year, but we wanna make sure that everyone who does have a business um, regarding arts and culture in the city is a part of it because this is only for Jersey City residents. Um, whether you have a business or if you're individual, you are eligible. There will be applications online. We are planning on doing sessions with Jersey City Public Library for anybody who needs to use their computers because the application will be online. And we just want to make sure that everyone who is interested is know knows about it and we want to make sure that it is properly publicized. And Ward F, you and me, we got to make sure ours gets a bunch of applications. Not at all biased. Let's see, Ward C. Exactly, not at all biased, but you know, Ward F rocks. So, um, did you have any questions? Any questions, Council? Um, just uh, as it relates to rolling out the schedule with the libraries and the online training, 
if you can just keep the council abreast via email, send it to the council president, that would be fantastic. No um, problem. And, and um, I, I know the number, but for the record, can you uh, like let the council know approximately how much funding will be going out for the first cycle? Yes, it's approximately, um, it's almost a million, so it's like 994,000 and some change. So 900,000, yeah, 900,000 is gonna go to art businesses, art nonprofits, and art for profit businesses, and then 1 million set aside for our. Hmm? 100, yeah, I'm sorry, 100,000, sorry. Yeah, because that's 900. Yeah, sorry, not good at math, psych major. Um, so 100,000 is gonna be set aside for art um, fellowships. So that's for individual artists, and it's a fellowship. So it's, it's um, what's considered non-restrictive funds for them to decide, but there still are requirements for the businesses and for the individuals at the end of the year. They have to be able to present something to the public, but all of that will be um, available. But our goal is to reach out to everyone via social media, via flyers, newspapers, and every, every way that people communicate so that we can get a vast number of applicants. Liz, yes. you, might have, uh, you might have said this, so is there a, um, a link or is there the application on your website currently that we can direct people to? The um, Cultural Affairs does have a page for us, but the application will not go live until approximately February 7th, February. But so what we're trying to do is we're just trying to get everybody excited about it. So let, the, yeah, let them know about it from now until um, February. And then once it goes live, it's for only one month. So we wanna make sure that people are already aware of it. So when it goes live, they can just instantly hit it and start filling out all their applications. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Liz. No problem. Thank you, Angelica. Thank you good to see you. Yep, likewise. Thank you. Have a good night. Okay. Okay, Sean. All righty. So with your permission, Council President, I'm going to just take it from the top. Yes. Right. So we're going right to our first reading ordinances. Item 3.1, City Ordinance 22-001, the first ordinance of the year. It's an ordinance amending Chapter 332, Vehicles and Traffic, Article 8, Permit Parking, Section 58, Parking Restrictions in Residential Zones of the Jersey City Code to allow residents within certain permit parking zones to obtain parking permits if on-site parking is at capacity. Sean, I'm going to withdraw this until um, Rich meet with Hilltop. Any, any of you other guys need to meet with your constituents about this? Okay. Okay. John, it's going to be with, it's be with yeah, council president. To the council president. Council president, I really couldn't hear what you said. I'm, I apologize. Oh no, we, I'm I'm gonna withdraw this one, Sean. Okay, until they want to meet. Rich wants to meet with Hilltop. Okay. So what is is there a problem with it or no? Well, table. Uh, no, Council President, Sean just didn't hear you. So Sean will confirm on the administration side that with, it'll be withdrawn uh, at the Wednesday meeting as well, at the request of the Council President. Thank you. Thank you, George. He has to meet. He has received a lot of calls, so we just want to be fair so Rich can meet. That's it. No problem. I just couldn't hear you, Council President. I apologize. Hey, hey. Council President, this is only for the, um, the zone permits in that Journal yeah. Square area. Item 3.2, City Ordinance 22-002 is an ordinance of the Municipal Council of the City of Jersey City establishing Chapter 73, a Women's Advisory Board of the City of Jersey City. Any questions? Any questions? Can anyone speak to uh, the mission? Um, you know. Oh, 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 you're, I was asking someone to talk about it. Yeah. Well, um, I put this ordinance for, forth because all that's happening right now with women across the country. And so we believe that we should form some type of uh, woman's advisory board because um, there are a lot of issues. And so because this is such a diverse city and we care about people so much, I just think it's just the right thing to do and it's the right timing. Um, Go ahead. It, I see it's, it's going to be composed of 11 members. Is, yeah. is it a, um, too much to ask that at least each ward candidate have the option to nominate? Um, 
I'm quite sure the mayor wouldn't have a problem with that, but this is set up like all the other boards. The mayor has a right to appoint, but he's always, um, you always take that in consideration. Each ward normally is represented, but it is his power. Okay? But I'll definitely make sure I mention that. Anything else? I think it's a great idea. I think so. Okay, Sean. Okay, item 3.3, City Ordinance 22-003 is an ordinance amending Chapter 84, Alcoholic Beverages and Cannabis, to establish reporting requirements for the Cannabis Control Board. Uh, good evening. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Yes, uh, there were uh, a couple concerns. This uh, relates to the uh, legalized cannabis ordinance that the council passed uh, in August of 2021. Uh, there were a couple things that, one, that we wanted to change with that. One, at the request of the council president, um, the cannabis control board that is created by uh, this ordinance, uh, the council president had wanted that board to report back to the council quarterly uh, regarding with on several criteria, including the applicants for the permits, um, residency, gender, race, nationality, um, and the location of the proposed business. Uh, so that is added in here as well. Uh, there were some other additions as well that um, were made late today that I see have just been incorporated into the recently approved one. Uh, Mr. Clark, we'll do what we need to do to get that uh, updated on the record on Wednesday. Uh, but the additions and the changes were to, and very briefly, to expand the Cannabis Control Board from three members to five, um, with one of those additional five members to be appointed by the council president directly, and to also institute a requirement that just the, very, the br very brief explanation on how the application process works. Once the city indicates their support and the application goes to the state, if the applicant meets all the state requirements, it then is sent back to the city. We had instituted a follow-up requirement um, in the interest of ensuring that nothing has changed, the circumstances haven't changed surrounding the applicant, whatever neighborhood they're in, um, if any other uh, facilities had opened in a close proximity to that, just so we get one last look at that uh, before the permit is finally finalized. And that was the addition of that um, final check, so to speak, uh, that we have put in this ordinance. So if anybody has any questions about this, I can obviously um, assist with that. If you have anything before, when obviously Wednesday's the first reading, but I will have some time to go over that, and um, obviously I can assist. Any question? I have a question regarding the application, and also at the bottom of the ordinance it says um, regarding the application that any other documents the city deems necessary. Um, so when I looked at the application online, I've received a number of complaints from people that are trying to apply. Um, that the application is a general application that is used for, let's say, you're trying to build a, a skyscraper or something. Um, it asks for a surveyor, it asks for a, a civil engineer, a traffic plan. I could understand, like, a traffic plan for uh, if you're trying to do industrial, you know, like if you build along Tunnelly Avenue, like a warehouse, so that you're a grow house and you're actually um, doing your growing cannabis, but when it comes to like retail or a retail license, or if you're doing a social equity ap applicant, um, I don't understand why you would need all those items. And I think that the application itself needs to be tailored towards cannabis versus uh, the general application that's currently being used. Um, so if we could take a look into that and change the application and um, make it more friendly for social equity applicants because it kind of defeats the purpose of the CRC. If you have to get a surveyor, you have to get a civil engineer, you need to get a traffic plan, all these items that uh, you're just trying to set up a, a shop at an existing business. Um, and that really sets up a lot of hurdles for uh, social equity applicants. Sure, Councilman, uh, I can set up a meeting with uh, you, myself, and maybe the cannabis working group in the city uh, to address some of those concerns. And Does that work? Yes. Okay. 
Also, uh, can you go through the process for me again? Um, so they have to get approved by the state or they have to get approved by the city first before they submit their application? Because I've heard two different things. Well, there's a city applicant. There, there's an applicant. The applicants need to meet you know, a basic set of criteria with the city, which includes are they within a certain number of feet of a school or park or daycare, et cetera. Uh, that is then determined by the engineer. Um, and then to make sure that they meet the other requirements, which um, I can, uh, pardon me. But there are other requirements. There are other requirements concerning residency, concerning um, obviously there are you know, disadvantaged communities that we wanna make sure are included in the process. And once the city receives everything, the Cannabis Control Board can, ensures, yes, this is a, this is a you know, candidate that we support and we want to uh, get behind, then it goes to the state. The state will then check to make sure on their end that it complies with all the state laws and regulations from their end. And then they send it back, then it will be sent back to the city. Um, we are adding just a final check to make sure, again, this is, a, this is a quickly changing city. Things can change in, you know, a month or two months that might really change the character of a neighborhood, that might change, um, you know, there might be another business that comes in, there might be a any number of factors that we just want to make sure we get a final look at it before it is um, mm -hmm. sign sealed delivered, so to speak. So, so Peter, let me ask you something. So it will have to go to the cannabis board twice then? Correct. Okay. I just want to make sure. I what would be this? Uh, so the process, the first one is to make sure um, they're adhering to all the rules, and then it goes to the state, and it's, what's, what's the second process when it comes back to us? Well, it, well the applicant, can, the, the candidate who has been approved by the state would then submit to the Cannabis Control Board for a final review, which would just, you know, simply be to make sure we complied with all, we're still in compliance with everything that we got on the first go around. Um, and to also make sure, you know, nothing's changed. There have been no substantive changes in the neighborhood, no changes to the business. If there was a funding source that maybe fell through, make sure that that's, you know, confirm all of that. Um, and then within 60 days of that, the Cannabis Review Board, Cannabis Control Board, rather, would issue a decision. Councilman, it also gives us a little more leverage that if uh, during the application process to the state, you know, there was some concerns within a particular neighborhood, uh, for the function of what's going to be built, that they would have to come back to us and we can address those issues or, or decide um, that they have to ch make a change to their plan. So it gives us a little more leverage on the local level to, uh, to get some feedback from the community and better understand how that facility would uh, function within a given area uh, while they're going through their approvals at the state level. And, and at both, both phases with the Cannabis Control Board, community input is, and the impact on the community is a large factor that goes into the decision. So, you know, there will be solicitation of community comment, and, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a major consideration as to concerns of people in the neighborhood, people in the community uh, that might have with a, business, with a facility opening in their community. Now, what happens if, I mean, I don't know, so I'm asking these questions. So what happens if, um, let's say it can't be, I don't know, 50 feet from a school or daycare, and during the process, they're not infringing upon that threshold, but when it comes back through the second time, they're like, oh, well, no, it's a daycare there now. So that will be cause to... That, that's one of the reasons that we're looking to ensure uh, new, new uh, operating... Uh, facilities for children, uh, you know, the, the continuation of a park that now it's too close to the park or, you know, um, that, those types of uh, functions. Or when they go to the state level, if they change or critique their uh, uh, tweak, rather their uh, application in any way, we'll now have to go back and, and, and review those changes and make sure that they're still in compliance. So it gives us an additional layer on the local level to make sure that the original plan works for the community stays to what the original plan was, and if it has to be changed, it gets changed at the local level prior to an opening. And, and, and related to that, you know, obviously it's a period of some months before, you know, the initial moment of the application with the city to the final, final approval. Planning and zoning and the um, HEDC in general will be keeping track of where the applications are. So 
that there won't accidentally be a school that opens within 100 feet of one of these facilities that then puts them at a major disadvantage. So it's, yeah, it's, gonna, it's gonna be tracked on both sides. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you something, Peter, just because you made that statement, okay? When they started out, there wasn't a school there, and we approved them. Now they went to the state and got approved. Now they come back, now there's a school. So where would that leave them? Because I, I know that could be a problem, especially for a micro-business, which oh, sure. is all your research. You understand what I'm saying? No, uh, uh, absolutely. And, and, supposed to do. And I think that's part, of the, that's part of the application process as the city sees it in zoning and planning would be, you know, we know at this address we have a pending application, Let's say somebody comes on and wants to open a preschool right. or another facility. It will, at least, it will flag that so at least it's, we have this concern, you know, look somewhere else depending on, you know, somewhere where we don't have one of these pending applications. And we work with that applicant, the um, school, so the school or daycare or whatever it is, to find a location that's not going to infringe on that pending uh, cannabis application. Thank you. I, have, Thank you. I have more questions. Um, so for the for this ordinance, is there a way that we could prioritize um, the social equity applicants over like let's say multi-state operators? I know there was a lot of talk about uh, doing that. Um, we said that during our last council meeting when we approved the cannabis ordinance, but I don't see anything like specifically saying that we're going to do that. And furthermore, when it comes to the identities and percentages of the owners, um, it says for each identified owner, I want it to be even more specific, you know, that they drill down, down to if there's limited partners, if they have shareholders, um, and where they essentially are domiciled. So I believe if they're using like a shell company, you know, I don't, I don't want to just see the shell company like our LLC name. I want to see who is behind right. that LLC. I believe the full, we did not publish the full ordinance tonight. We just simply published the parts that changed. I believe the full ordinance addresses that concern, but I'll double check. Uh, but I think that's something to be mindful of. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Questions? So, Peter, I, I, I know you said it before you started um, addressing the council, but there was a correction that needed to be done to that particular ordinance that didn't make it? That's okay. There, there were a number of additions that came in late um, that I can email you separately to show you what was added. Um, I guess we have to put that on the record verbally on Wednesday? Yes. Okay. So I can help you read it if you'd like. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a matter of just stating it for the record. We're not actually amending. Uh, we don't amend the first reading ordinance. We just add to it because we didn't advertise it yet for a public right. hearing. And it is now published with the updated versions published with the agenda. So if the council Correct. wants to look at that. Thank you. Okay, council members, there are no second reading ordinances. Uh, request for a hearing. We have two speakers listed. And then we have our petitions and communications. For the new council members, these are communications, letters that we receive in the clerk's office that I feel that um, could be important to the city. And if there's any CC'd, we make copies and send them out to the, co to the CC's, like saying if, if something that involves city planning or the Division of Engineering, Traffic, and Transportation, we would make a photocopy of that and send it right to those individuals, the division directors. So with that being said, any questions on item 6.1 through... 6.25 and for the new council members if you needed to see or wanted a copy of any of those petitions and communications all you would have to do is just email me um, or my deputy john hallinan and we would get you the copy uh, before the meeting we're good okay no officer communications and then we have reported directors reported directors for the new council members these are the letters from the mayor if the mayor is uh, appointing someone to a board or agency as we see here these are both planning board appointments that he is making um, these are letters um, also appointing directors if you've seen the uh, on the uh, reorganization meeting we had two reported directors appointing uh, director, um, excuse me, business administrator Metro, 
and Director of DPW, uh, Kearse. Uh, again, if you need to see copies of these, please let us know and we'll get them to you immediately. Next is the claims. These are all the claims that uh, are going to be up for approval. So any payments that are made, any payments that are made to any outside vendor, the City Council must approve those payments. And this is the list uh, of payments that are being made for this meeting. And if you have an individual question or want to see a copy of an individual voucher or requisition, again, that's something you would request from my office as well. Any questions? Excellent. All right, so getting down to our resolutions, uh, 10.1 was touched on earlier, 10.2, uh, resolution 22-007. It's a resolution honoring the life of Deacon Ulysses Bob Monroe. 10.3, resolution 22-008 is a resolution, number one, introducing and approving the 2022 budget of the Jackson Hill Main Street Special Improvement District and directing the city clerk to publicly advertise the budget and schedule a public hearing. And number three, directing the tax assessor to prepare an assessment role of properties within the district based upon the budget. Sean, if I could touch on that. Sure. Uh, so can, the, for the newer council members, uh, each SID uh, does have a budget and uh, they present it to the council. It's, it's just like the budget for the municipal council uh, in, in the city where it's introduced and then uh, there's a public hearing and, and, a, and a conversation. So the introduction is just to present the information to the council and then it'll come back at a later time with the SID director and they'll uh, explain if there's any questions and uh, there'll be a public hearing on as well. So this is just the first part and it'll come back uh, with the director uh, to explain it. So this is the first and you'll see uh, every SID uh, participate in the same manner. Any questions? Thank you, BA. And usually from when the uh, budget is introduced, 28 days must elapse before we can have a public hearing and final consideration of adoption, just like the regular budget. Okay, item 10.4 and five were touched on earlier. Ten, item 10.6, resolution 22-011 is a resolution authorizing the execution of a license and gift agreement between the city of Jersey City and the friends of Van Voorst Park to create a memorial plaque program. If you have any questions, just interrupt me and I'll stop reading. Um, items 10.8, seven through 10.12 have been touched on earlier. Item 10.13, resolution 22-018. It's a resolution authorizing the award of a contract to Software House International for a new Google Workspace Enterprise Plus email system under New Jersey State contract for the Department of Public Safety Division of Communications. I did have a question about this. Is this, I think, sure. okay. uh, Yeah, so. Uh, Councilman, I do have a memo from uh, Director Baker, which I will distribute to the council. Uh, she's dealing with some COVID uh, restrictions, but uh, this is for the server on the communication side of the email service. So just so the council knows, uh, the city side of the email server and the communications for the public safety on two separate uh, servers, uh, particularly because they need added levels of security with 911 and uh, police communication so that they can't be interfered with and then our side is uh, separate because we have uh, more public uh, availability for OPA request and all that type of stuff. So theirs is a little bit more hardwired, if you will, than ours. But uh, Councilman, if you have a question, I could try to answer it or if you, I can definitely get you an answer by tomorrow. Sure, yeah, I mean, I just wanted kind of an understanding of why we were going with this system and I don't have a good sense of costs, but I mean, it's, a, it's a over $1 million expenditure, so I just wanted to you know, really understand why we were making this choice. Sure, um, I do have a memo from the director, but um, it's not a renewal, it's, uh, it's a new um, contract, but it's replacing an existing contract. So I'll, I'll make sure that we get the information on what the existing contract was and what the new one is for tomorrow. Sure, and just the reasons for sure. potentially a switch and then just why this vendor, you know, was done through a uh, purchasing um, cooperative. So just understanding of why we selected this vendor and, and how the cost compared to potentially other vendors. Okay, yeah, I'll definitely have all that information for you. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Already, item 10.14, resolution 22-019 is a resolution authorizing the city, the Jersey City Department of Public Safety Division of Police to apply for and accept 
funds under the fiscal year 2021 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant state program through the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office. So council, I'll just give a quick introduction on this. This is a grant that we'd be applying for, uh, for community relations uh, through public safety. So um, when we send out officers on patrol for community awareness and, and certain initiatives, the grant will cover those service hours uh, for those individuals. So the way that works is uh, each um, public safety officer is uh, salary, and what this would do is offset uh, a portion of their salary that they use uh, for those community relation initiatives. So, um, so what happens if, so it, it was subsidized a portion of the salary. Um, what about with respect to overtime? Uh, so it would just be, um, what they do is just X amount of service hours. They don't consider the overtime. So it's, they, okay. it's a, a lump sum, if you will, right? And not to exceed $100,000, whether the city uses that on straight time or overtime is at the city's purview. It's always our initiative to do it on straight time because obviously you get more bang for your buck. What are some examples of the work they will be doing? Uh, some of the examples they had uh, listed in the grant is, um, you know, uh, for lack of better words, visiting the bodegas, you know, kind of doing uh, street foot patrol. patrol, foot patrol, foot patrol, um, awareness around uh, education centers or schools, uh, you know, kind of uh, just physical presence on foot, foot patrols. Now, I know um, there have been talks last year, as recently as last year, with regards to foot patrol, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, that each municipal, I mean, each um, precinct foot patrol is determined upon the captain in that, uh, in that precinct, and it differ from precinct to precinct. So with these additional funds, will we see a more universal foot patrol approach? So what it is is, uh, yeah, we could work with the councilman on that if you have any specific targeted areas. Um, this would be the existing ones that we have. We've received this grant last year. So it would still cover the, the same amount of hours that we used from last year, but we can change the designation of where, uh, working with Director Moody. Yeah. And uh, I'll just, I'll mention it now, at the uh, request of the council, we will be adding uh, seven resolutions for closed sessions in which uh, uh, we'll discuss operations and personnel uh, with the uh, council and the respective directors. And, uh, the, the director will be available to discuss that as well. Were any of these foot patrols done in the Heights area? Uh, I can get you that information, Councilman. I'm not sure, you know, uh, at this at this time, but I can definitely get you the information on that. But this is uh, this grant is for future ones, so we definitely have an opportunity to incorporate uh, any hot zones that it, the council members uh, feel are represented. Okay, um, items 10.15 through 10.19 were touched on earlier. Item 10.20, resolution 22-025 is a resolution authorizing the award of a contract for the purchase and delivery of 2022 Ford Explorer vehicles through Sourcewell Purchasing Cooperative for the Department of Public Works Division of Automotive Maintenance. We did that one? I apologize, I didn't mark that one. Thanks. And that will um, take us items 10.21 through 10.26 were touched on earlier. Item 10.27, resolution 22-032 is a resolution renewing the award of a professional service agreement with McCuster, Azalmi, Roslyn, and Carvelli PC to represent the city of Jersey City in various equal employment opportunity independent investigations. Right, uh, this is human resources, but I can speak on it. Um, essentially, you know, when there are equal, when there are EEO complaints that are made uh, with the city, uh, it was determined several years ago that it was beneficial to have a neutral uh, third party uh, sort of referee the claims. Um, so, uh, one second. And yeah, not, no, I, I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. Uh, this is for the EEO investigation. So if there's a complaint that's made uh, to the city and to human resources, we determined that it was good to have a neutral third party come in, investigate, interview people, et cetera, prepare a report with recommendations. So uh, this is the firm that's been doing this for us now for a couple of years. Uh, they've been doing a very good job and um, human resources would like to continue that relationship. 
this is sorry, B and Council President. Sorry, this is not specific to this item, but Council President, I remember you know, periodically we do the updates with the law department that's sort of you know comprehensive on the major cases facing the city. And I know like the payroll, there's a agenda item here on the payroll tax. Is that something we can sort of schedule in the near future? So sure. yeah, we can do council members, all of us can get kind of the full update on the major cases. Right, that's fine. I can work with, I apologize, is Desiree still with your office or? Okay, who, who, who can I reach out to to schedule this? Juju. Juju, raise your hand, please. Oh. Hi, I'll shoot, I'll shoot you an email uh, tomorrow. We can get something scheduled. Do you want the um, resolution on for the meeting Wednesday to set up that? Yes. Okay. Do we have any statistics on how long like each case uh, is resolved when it's done in-house versus if we did it um, through, you know, third party? Your specifically the EEO cases? Yeah. Uh, I do I do not know. I like I can check into that. Just wondering. And um also if we have any data on is the city following the recommendations um, that they're making when they do these independent um, investigations? I, I would say, you know, generally, generally the answer is yes. Um, but you know, we could, I could talk to you more about that offline if you have any concerns about that. When we have a, when we have the closed session, I think we can bring all of that out. When we have the closed session, okay. Okay, we, we can get human resources in to join that and sure. speak about that. Okay. Item 10.28, resolution 22-033 is a resolution approving the notice in lieu of a deed notice for Carteret Avenue in accordance with NJAC 7 semicolon 26C-7.2C21. Hi, good afternoon, um, council, um, council president and council members. Um, this is basically a parcel of land that's around um, Carteret Avenue and um, Garfield Avenue. It was a condemnation that was done. And normally what we have to do, we have to do like a remediation of whatever contaminations that is normally found. And this is a deed notice that is part of the process. Um, PCG is, is the property they're gonna be actually doing the actual remediation for this particular parcel. We have an agreement with them to do certain things that they need to do. Um, it has to be actually approved by um, the New Jersey Department of um, Environmental Protection. So once this deed notice is, is filed with the state, they can actually do the remediation for this particular parcel. It also includes Carteret Avenue, which apparently the street, the actual roadway of Carteret um, Avenue that needs to be remediated as part of the parcel. So this is what it, this is about. So is uh, this is Carteret and Garfield coming up the hill? Yeah, so it's right, it's um, near, near the Berry Lane Park and it's behind, um, it's a PPG property, but it's also, it's not too far from the brewery, the 902 brewery. Oh, so it's okay, going through, all right. There's a big parcel right. of land which includes the actual street of Carteret Avenue. Mm -hmm. Questions? Okay. Thank you. Item 10.29, resolution 22 034 is a resolution authorizing the settlement of a lawsuit entitled 161st Street Urban Renewal LLC versus the City of Jersey City. Okay. Um, we circulated the memo regarding this uh, proposed settlement earlier today. Uh, just for the benefit of the new council people, um, you know, obviously settlements in excess of $40,000 must be approved by the council. Um, we submit a confidential memo to the council people giving essentially the facts of the case, our assessment of the case, et cetera, um, including our recommendation. Um, if you have any questions about that, we're happy to address that offline. However, we cannot discuss that on the record uh, because of attorney-client privilege. Item 10.30, resolution 22-035 is a resolution renewing professional service agreement with the law firm of Porzio, Broomberg, and Newman PC to serve as special counsel on behalf of the city of Jersey City in payroll tax litigation. Right, I can give the council a very brief update on this. Um, the matter was, you know, we prevailed at the appellate level. 
Um, the plaintiffs petitioned for certification uh, with the state Supreme Court. Um, it was granted as to a very, very narrow issue, uh, specifically whether we could tax um, only non-residents and not residents of Jersey City. We as the city um, and the state as well filed a cross petition on a very narrow issue that we lost uh, at the appellate level, uh, specifically about the definition of a supervisor, whether you know if you're supervising someone at a business in Jersey City, but that person's working out of Kearney, for instance, uh, whether that person would be considered a Jersey City employee. So we have those two issues only that, were, that are up for appeal, that are up for argument rather before the state Supreme Court. We do not have a date yet for that argument. However, given the tremendous backlog that we have, uh, I imagine it'll be heard later this year. Uh, but nevertheless, we did obtain a stay on the enforcement of any kind of um, the ruling on that collection of not residents and non-residents. So we are, we are and can continue to collect the payroll tax proceeds as we have been doing. And um, again, once again, this is a case that we are in with uh, the city of Newark as well with their payroll tax program. And, uh, and one more item, any concerns about the contract length and the amount? Uh, generally, the briefs that are filed are very supplemental. They're not, there's not a tremendous amount of additional work to do other than the preparation for oral argument. Um, so we can imagine that this will not be a tremendously expensive contract, um, but obviously we will track that and keep you apprised. This is for the BA. Um, do we know how much we're giving the Board of Ed for uh, the payroll tax? Councilman, so the law states that we can give the Board of Ed up to what they've lost in state aid and, and not to exceed that. So um, there is some legislation uh, at the state level that says that uh, um, the state may owe them uh, money as well. So we're looking for more clarification on what the aggregate will be. And, and how much we could uh, we can give them. Um, the numbers have been pretty consistent uh, uh, quarter over quarter. Um, I can get the council report of what we have year to date, but um, that number floats around 65 to 75 thousand, uh, 65 to 75 million dollars annually. And uh, you know we hope that whatever the state would potentially owe them through this litigation uh, would offset any additional. Uh, dollars that exceed that amount. So we're just looking for some clarification on that amount. And uh, usually, probably in around March, the Board of Ed will have more clarification. And they'll uh, X the city uh, via letter. Um, you know, this is how much we lost. This is how much we need. Please provide us what's the total in the payroll trust fund. And then ask us on how much they could, uh, they could have of that. Do we know the status of whether or not the state is decreasing the funding for the Board of Education, knowing that because of the CARES Act funding that they received, the state received, they weren't supposed to cut funding for uh, minority districts and uh, low-income districts? Yeah, uh, you're spot on, Councilman. That's what I was referring to as far okay. as we're not sure how much the state will owe them. Uh, okay. There is a legal opinion that says they would owe the Board of Ed some back money. So once we get clarification on uh, if, March, there's, right? if there's an appeal process or, or, or if that's a stay and they, they do get the dollars remitted, and then we'll see what the aggregate is from there and, and, and work with the council. Uh, I do work with the BA, Regina Robinson, very well, and um, she told me as soon as she has an update, she'll provide it to us. Thank you so much, both you and Peter Baker. Thank you. Okay, item 10.31, resolution 22-036. It's a resolution renewing professional service agreement with the law firm of Warner Suarez to represent the city of Jersey City in the matter of Van Doyle. Um, if, if I may, uh, Council President and Clerk, I can just kind of explain. We had we sent an email to the Council President earlier today um, providing a brief update on where these cases are uh, in the litigation process. Again, because of attorney-client privilege issues, we can't really speak on the record about issues of strategy or anything of that nature. However, um, if you have any questions offline, we're happy to answer those. Um, I will point out uh, for the clerk, uh, item 1033, resolution 22-038, 
uh, we will be uh, withdrawing that matter, that um, item. Which one, Peter? 10.33. Yes. Which is resolution 22-038. Yes. Right. Item 10.32, resolution 22-037 is a resolution renewing the award of a professional service agreement with Cleary Jacoby Alferi Jacobs LLC to represent Mayor Stephen Fulop and the City of Jersey City in the manner of Alfena, Alfena, excuse me, Ograro versus the City of Jersey City. Sorry about that. And just as um, Corporation Counsel Peter Baker stated, item 10.33. Resolution 22-038 will be withdrawn by uh, the BA at the uh, council meeting on Wednesday. Uh, next is item 10.34, resolution 22-039 is a resolution renewing professional service agreement with Kalkinetti and Kavchevsky LLP to represent Edward Toloza, tax assessor Robert Kakaleski, business administrator, Mohamed Akil, former Chief of Staff, and the City of Jersey City in the matter of Roxanne Mays versus the City of Jersey City. Next is item 10.35, resolution 22-040 is a resolution ratifying the award of professional service agreement with Silsman and Schwartz LLP to represent third party defendant, the City of Jersey City in the matter of Robert Byrne versus Kelly J. Cruz, Fidelity and Guarantary Insurance Underwriters, excuse me, versus the City of Jersey City. Item 10.36, Resolution 22-041 is a resolution renewing professional service agreement with the law firm of Chase and Lemporello, Mallon and Capuzzo, PC, to represent Sergeant Rosley, Rossi Borzola in the matter of Donna and Michael Glassinger versus the city of Jersey City. Weren't we supposed to have a closed session on this? Remember? We can, we can include that in the uh, broader one that you would like. I did not, I, I know there were some questions about that, but I did not prepare the closed session resolution. We can include, ball that in with the um, broader one that we do, if you'd like. No, that was agreed on uh, about two months ago, or whatever, three months ago, that we're gonna have a closed session on that. Okay. Um, if you'd like, we, we can uh, withdraw that if you'd like, and then we can wait until after the, um, the, the litigation update with uh, the council. All right. Okay, so we'll, we'll be uh, withdrawing 10.36. Uh, 10. 10. 36. 36. Okay. Resolution 22.041. Right, got it. Okay, and the rest, the balance of the resolutions were touched on earlier um, we are adding the seven resolutions for the closed sessions as per the BA um, is there anything else that we need to yeah. discuss yes yeah, so council oh. president and uh, city clerk I apologize I, I have a late item that I'd like to add which is just a resolution extending the Suez ad hoc committee that we had been doing but just reestablishing it for the next thing and for Council persons Gilmore and Digis especially um, just what we did is we established a committee in September to look at Suez and MUA's response to specifically the, uh, you know, wa boil water advisory during Hurricane Ida, as well as prior boil water advisories and prepare recommendations. We've gone through four meetings. We have two more scheduled, one on January 24th, and I believe the other on February 7th. And this would basically be, these are public meetings, they're advertised through the clerk's office um, with members of the council who would like to be part of the committee. Um, and there's currently four of us on the committee, um, but if either of you two would like to join, you're welcome to do so and I'll pass around a copy of the agenda. But the reason we're trying to get this on is we want to get it reapproved, the committee in the new council session before the January 24th meeting. And for the new council members, just so you know, these meetings will be virtual. Um, that's what the committee had voted on and decided. So the meetings will continue to be virtual on those ad hoc committees. So we'll be adding the seven closed sessions resolutions and the ad hoc committee resolution. Just keep in mind, I need six votes in order to add those items on Wednesday. With that being said. Motion um, to adjourn. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, um, I, can't, I can't help but think that there's like a plethora of lawsuits um, 
against the city. I don't, there's so many. I'm just um, trying to figure out, have we considered the conversation? Did we create a mechanism to try to, one, see how we can have an environment where, where these things are not occurring, whatever the allegations is, and two, um, at what point do we, do we stop, you know, just using taxpayers' funds to, to deal with these legal situations? Um, because I'm, like I said, I'm just looking and, I don't know, maybe because I'm a rookie and I don't understand the politics all the way, but I just can't help but think that this, this is enormous amounts of money going to legal representation for individuals as it relates to um, this litigation. Uh, Councilman, I could speak to that briefly, and uh, we'll touch on those specific lawsuits in that closed session uh, with the Corporation Council. But, you know, a city our size and an entity our size, we do face a, a variety of lawsuits. Uh, it's not always personnel matters. Sometimes it has to do with public safety and police. Uh, trip and falls, uh, you know, we also have an insurance fund commission which um, kind of alleviates some of this stuff by creating settlements or dealing with medical records. And, uh, and, and we do our best to really understand uh, where a lawsuit may be going and to decide if there's worthy of a settlement or, uh, you know, we lean our prof on our professionals for that. Um, sometimes we have conflicts where we have to hire our outside counsel um, to represent us. So we do try our due diligence to try to alleviate some of these. And if we see that uh, there's an opportunity to get out of it, uh, then extending, we do. Um, but the reason you're seeing a lot of these here today are there are contract extensions on prior matters that we have to give to the council for approval yearly. So. Every council meeting won't be uh, this burdensome. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, we do have a, a good legal team here that tries to mitigate uh, the exposure as much as possible. And what we also do is, you know, we have a lawsuit for something and, and, and we lose, right? We, we install the corrective action to make sure it doesn't happen again. So, you know, broken steps, you know, they, they shouldn't have been broken. Someone fell, you know, we're responsible for that, but we make sure in part of the settlement process that they're repaired and, and, and those types of things. And um, sometimes with employee relations, it's just not, uh, it's just unavoidable if an employee's terminated or, uh, you know, there's some kind of matter of that, and it's their right to sue us, and, and we try to handle on each case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Um, also, one more thing, pardon me, people. No, um, to learn. I wanted to know if, uh, what if anything um, stops the council from getting the agenda, let's say on a Wednesday, so it give us at least a week. Um, and again, I'm a rookie, so I'm asking all these questions. I don't wanna hold anybody up for leaving or anything. Um, so is that something we can do to, to, to work on so we can have at least a, a week early? I know there's um, time limits with regards to things coming and things like that. So, so, so Councilman, what we could do is uh, I'll work diligently to maybe get it to th Thursday. Uh, it's a little more complicated with Wednesday because we have our actual agenda meeting on Wednesday and we try to get everything together there. But just so to better understand uh, how a lot of these uh, resolutions come to, uh, to the council, uh, they initiate with their division, they go to a department. From the department, they go to legal. Legal, sometimes they have to go to purchasing uh, for approvals. And then we also have diversity and inclusion that reviews all of our contracts to see if there's local or minority vendors uh, available. So with that process, actually, we ask that the, that the directors uh, put those in place 14 days prior to this meeting. So uh, we try our best to get everything uh, done, but it is like a three-week process to get a resolution uh, because of all the approvals. Um, but I can try to get it out. With, I'll work with the clerk and the, and the uh, the uh, council president to see if we can get it out, you know, Thursday if th if that would be a good amends. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right. I believe there was a motion made, but I'm going to ask it again. I need a motion to motion adjourn to at adjourn. six twenty-one p.m. Second. Motion was made by Councilperson Soleil, and the second was made by Councilperson Solomon. On the motion to adjourn at 6.21 p.m., Councilperson Ridley. Aye. Councilperson Prinzeri. Aye. Councilperson Bargiano. Councilperson Soleil. Aye. Councilperson Solomon. Aye. Councilperson Gilmore. 
Aye. Councilperson DeGeese. Aye. Councilperson Rivera. Aye. And Council President Warneman. Aye. Motion carries 9-0 to adjourn at 6.21 p.m. Thank you so much, Council President, members of the Council, professional staff, everybody in the attendance. Thank you so much for your patience. This is our first meeting in this room for over two years. So again, teamwork makes the dream work. Stay safe. Have a great night. Sean, I'm now going to add an emergency resolution banning QB sneaks on 3rd and 9. I didn't think I was going to get beat up because you guys made the playoffs, but okay, I'll take it. I did ask Derek Carr to throw the game, but I guess they didn't want to end it in tie.